Praise God. Well, uh, we're going to continue on in um, our uh, subject on healing. Amen. And uh, I've been getting a lot out of this, building my own faith, uh, you know, going along and it's just good stuff. Amen. How, I was curious, how many of y'all that have been coming uh, during this have actually had or purchased and have gone through at all uh, the Christ the Healer book? Anybody? See your hand. One hand. Let me see your hand high so I can. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, five people. Okay. I encourage you to do that. Um, it's really, uh, it's an excellent book. Uh, it's a classic, uh, like he says in there, tens of thousands of people have written in testimonies. I think it was written in the, gosh, I don't remember, 1920s, 30s, somewhere in there, maybe the 40s, I don't remember. But uh, he said that uh, tens of thousands of people have written in to them uh, telling that they have been healed through the teaching, through applying the teaching on what they had received from that and uh, it's great if you're more of a, not, a, not a, a reader, you can go on YouTube and find it, Christ the Healer, uh, and just figure out a timeline of how you'd like to listen to that. Um, I have it on, in my Kindle, and I have it on uh, Audible, and I've also found it and marked it on YouTube, so I've gone through all three of those at different times. But the information in there is very, very powerful. And let's be honest with ourselves. This is Monday school, okay? Everybody say school. The emphasis is on school. So you know when you go to school and you got to get whatever you're trying to get from school, you got to put the work in or you're going to get like I did. Or, or, or Chris Musgrove said he went to Florida State and um, in his whatever first, second semester, he got um, all Fs and an F. So uh, don't be a Chris, okay? Don't be Chris Musgrove. Uh, you got to apply yourself, and if you're going to get anything, if you're going to get that, uh, you know, whatever you're looking for out of that college class or your degree or whatever you're headed for, you've got to put in the work or else you're not going to get the grades, right? So it's the same way with Monday school and Christianity as a whole. If you're just going to be a, what, what James calls a, and we're all this, to some degree, but he said, be doers of the word, not hearers only. Amen? And then he goes on to say it a different way. He said, a forgetful hearer. So, you know, I preach the messages, the ones I preach, and two, three days later, I forgot what I've even preached, you know? So imagine the listener, you know, I've actually put the time into preparing it and going over it and preaching it, so I would have a better chance of remembering it, but sometimes for me, a few days in, I've forgotten even what I've preached about. So what, he, what he's trying to say there is you've got to apply what you're hearing because, again, this is school, and if you're just hearing only and not doing, you're going to get zero results. Okay, now you may be inclined to think like so many, uh, you know, church people do that just sitting here hearing something is going to bless you and you do get blessed in the moment when you're listening, right? How many of y'all blessed sometimes just listening to the word preached or taught, uh, you know, in different aspects of the Holy Spirit's ministry in a given uh, gathering? Uh, and that's fine and good. I think uh, it seems to me a lot of the body of Christ has stopped there. They're content with just having a blessing from a service. But, you know, I'm all for that. You know, I'm all for, you know, the being blessed in a corporate gathering. I love it more than anybody. Uh, but more than anything is I want to know that I can apply the word of God and I can get it to work for me every time. Amen? Like we've talked in in. Monday school in particular, how many of us would like to have every prayer answered? Would you like to have every prayer answered? Amen. Would you like to know every time you step out on God's word in faith, the result would come? Well, that's not just for the select few. You know, the different, I was telling Laura the other day, the different ministers that have uh, spoken into my life over the years, you know, some of the great ones. Uh, you know, they had a point in their life and ministry uh, where they just became determined. Listen to this. You'll, you'll, you'll get something out of this. 
the, the great ones that we know and recognize, uh, anybody really that's produced anything from God's word, they, I believe most, if not all of them, came to a point where they said, I can't keep looking at this and not having a result. Amen? I remember, for example, uh, uh, Or Roberts. Anybody know who Or Roberts is? Well, he, uh, I read his, um, whichever one it is, I get it, what is it, the biography? Which is the one somebody else writes? Biography or autobiography? Biography. Wh which one is it? Is it? Okay, thank you. Uh, I've read uh, a, a, a couple of his biographies from different people, and they all express this uh, same incident that happened in Oral Roberts' life where he was a pastor, I think in... Uh, one of them cities and places in Oklahoma. You, 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 you I can't remember the name of it. Uh, but he, uh, he basically locked himself in the church or in the bedroom at the house, one of the two, and he told his wife, I'm not coming out till I hear from God. I'm not coming out of this room until I get a hold of, there's something that the Lord wants me to experience and I'm not experiencing it right now. And he locked himself in there, well, you know, he got a hold of God, and that was the, he said basically at the end of that, however many days it was, he said uh, the Lord ministered to him. He got a revelation about healing, and he said uh, he was pastoring a church there, and he said, I'm just going to do a healing meeting, and I'm going to invite everybody, you know, and all that. Well, he did, and more people came in the droves, and he guaranteed there was going to be miracles that night. Well, how I many know you got to have a hold of something to do that? Well, it's interesting to me, thinking about it, I wonder how many years Oral Roberts lived that way in a constant state of frustration, something inside of him nagging him, saying, there's more to this. There's more than what you're experiencing right now. Well, finally, he gave into that in just a matter of days, he stepped into more of a fullness of what God had for him. Now, somebody might say, oh, that's Oral Roberts, and that's this one, and that's Kenneth Hagin, and that's the other one. But the thing is, here, I, I hate that we glorify uh, these individuals. And yes, they're mightily used by God, and I, have, I respect that, and I honor that. Uh, but the truth is, they're just regular people like you and me. Uh, now, they may have grown into an anointing, may have been called into a five-fold ministry position. But all that aside, I believe those ministry gifts, those people got results from God's Word not primarily as a ministry gift. For example, Kenneth Hagin said, uh, he describes uh, this story of, you know, he, he wrote a book called I Believe in Visions, or he didn't write any books. They put a book together with his stories in it, and it's called I Believe in Visions, a great book, powerful book. And he expresses in there about the eight times that he had a visitation from Jesus. And, you know, some people may think that's weird and flaky, uh, you know, and there are people out there that have experiences that are probably not legitimate. I get all that. But you can mark Kenneth Hagin's ministry and realize that uh, he, he was the real deal, right? So he expresses in this uh, one of the visions, he said that he, was, uh, he had been writing a letter to a pastor about coming to speak. Uh, you know, it's back in the day before, when you actually had to write, all right? Anybody find themselves forgetting how to write? I can't even sign my name sometimes. My brain has to like get the cobwebs off it to remember how to write. But he was writing a letter to a pastor and saying that um, uh, he wanted to come and speak. And uh, he just had this check on the inside of him. And he said, man, something's not right. I just don't know what to do. He'd crumple up the letter, throw it in the wastebasket. And he, about 10 letters later, he still didn't get the letter out. And during this time, he had a visitation, one of these visitations from Jesus and the Lord began to speak to him, and he said this. He said, I'm going to tell you right now that I want you to go to that church. I want you to go to that church. And uh, Brother Hagin said, they only have like 80 or 90 people, 100 people. And he's like, I got to have X amount of dollars. You know, he's telling the Lord what, what he needs, you know. I, I got to have this much money, and I already got an invitation from this big church that I know they'll guarantee me X amount of dollars a week for my meetings and all this stuff. And he said, the Lord spoke to him and said, I don't want you to go to that other church. He said, I want you to go to the church that invited you. And he, then the Lord said this to him. He said, now I'm leading, you're seeing me in this vision. 
and he said, I'm telling you not to go to that church and go to the other one. He said, but I'm never going to lead you this way ever again. He said, you're going to have to learn how to follow the inward witness, inward witness just like every other one of my children. Isn't that interesting? And, you know, yes, he stood in the office of a prophet. Yes, he was a teacher uh, and, 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 and had tremendous results. But for the most part, Kenneth Hagin, like all the rest of them, operated by their own personal fellowship and connection with God's word and living by faith. Amen. Now, is anybody hearing what I'm saying right now? Because this is extremely powerful. Uh, you know, because we put it off all the time, Christian people, church people put it all over on the man of God to bring the word and bring the gifts and bring the healings and bring the miracles. But the reality of it is each and every one of us as Christian people have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. We have access to this word of God. We can experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, uh, you know, operate in the supernatural. Everybody can do that. That's not just a, I'm a man of God thing, okay? That's every one of us can have access to that. Amen. Amen. Now, do you believe that? Yeah. Well, that's, that's kind of one of those things. What does it take to get there? Well, Laura and I were talking today um, in filming one of the upcoming podcasts, and we were, we were just saying how Laura just, gosh, I almost just had to walk off the podcast thing. She was just tearing it up, and I was like, man, this is so good. But we were talking about faith. Everybody say faith. I'm going to get into my lesson in just a minute. We were talking about faith, and we said, well, you know, faith comes from hearing God's word. Anybody know that verse? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes in the context of the chapter. He's talking about salvation. And he said, faith for salvation comes from, he excuse me, hearing God's word. Amen? Everybody say hearing. And Laura just started bringing this thing out how also faith for the wrong things comes from hearing. And I just, I, I just never really saw it in this exact light, the way that she was putting it. But she said, you know, uh, uh, you're watching the news and they're talking about, you know, this thing and that thing's happening and this disease has started and this. And I, and I got to realize, and man, you sit there and listen to that stuff. And what, what begins to happen? You start thinking about that. And what it does is it opens up the door to fear. You start hearing people talk about, oh, the economy is going to crash. The stock market's going to crash. Oh, there's going to be a famine. Hey, I've thought about that in recent years. Amen? What, what, what happens? This is what you hear in the world. What happens if the food chain supply is cut and there ain't no food at the grocery store? What are you going to do? Well, you listen to all that all day. And you're going to be doing like everybody did in Y2K. You're going to be storing up 55 gallons of rice and beans and whatever else. And funny thing is, we, we had from Y2K, we had about four or five uh, 55 gallon drums out in that shed filled with beans that never ever got used for 20 years and we finally threw them out. So what does hearing the wrong thing do? It causes you to act the wrong way. So faith works the same in the good areas and the bad areas. Laura brought out today how our culture is driven by the, the, the uh, what's it called, the, the health care system. Although one doctor calls it the sick care system because they're not really doing a lot for health. They're just trying to put Band-Aids on sickness. Amen? But we're, we're in this world system where we're hearing and hearing. I mean, Laura, she just... She, she did a great job, but she's saying how every other TV commercial is about a sickness and a disease. Everything in magazines, everything, all the advertisements on the internet, everything you see on social media. Oh, man, I'm dealing with this. Oh, what kind of treatments do I need? Does anybody know a doctor for this? And I'm not saying that in a condemning way. I'm just saying in a factual way. That's the world that we live in, right? So when we go to, uh, you know, we hear a lesson on faith, about healing and then we try to appropriate it laura said you got to realize you've already got a mountain of beliefs and convictions that have been coming and being formed in your heart and mind your entire life amen about what sickness and disease 
So the, when you and I experience a symptom or anything, Lars said it on the podcast today, we're gonna, you, you go on WebMD and you're putting in your symptoms and you're going to find out, oh gosh, this, oh, oh Lord, I have the epizootie now. I've got the epizootie, the uh, lower appendectomy of the uh, uh, whatever. You know, you're going to find it and it's going to be, oh, that's exactly what I'm having. Oh, that must be what I got. So you don't even need a doctor anymore. You just diagnose yourself. Right? Then you Google uh, home remedies for the epizootie. You know? Then you're trying to figure out, you know, oh, yeah. But the thing is, I want you to notice what is your first response when you experience a symptom? I told Laura we, uh, today, we were saying if you got 100 Christians from a good church, you got 100 heathens that didn't go to church at all, you put them all in one room and surveyed them, you'd find out one thing probably pretty quick. They probably talk a lot the same. They watch the same entertainment. They're connected to the same media outlets. They dress similar. They eat at a lot of the same places and, and on and on and on. What is that to say? That's to say that there's not a lot of separation between church and world. It's one thing, and that's what the devil's done over 2,000 years. He's put, tried to put the church right in the middle of all of the world system and, and put it in there with all the other religions, right, and said, this is the way this is. But God says that's not the way that it is. I'm not a religion. I've actually done what I needed to do to get people out of the world system. So when we get born again, the, the, the scripture says, come out from among the world. Amen. And we're talking about sickness and disease here and healing. And I'm going to tell you, just honestly speaking, you're going to be pretty hard pressed to walk in health and, and healing connected to a world system that only talks about sickness and disease. Amen. I read a book, uh, gosh, it, probably 25 years ago, I read a book. It was by a guy named George Malkmus, Mal Malkmus, Malkmus, something like that. And it was called Why Christians Get Sick. It was not, not a book that I thought it was going to be about. I opened it, caught my interest. I thought, oh, this is interesting. Well, this, he was a pastor, George Malkmus. He said he was 40, 39, 40 years old, something like that, pastored a church up north, Great church, successful church, thriving church, but his health was failing, and he was only 40 years old. And uh, gr just a great, great testimony. Well, anyway, he said he went away, sought the Lord, and, and the Lord started dealing with him from the Bible that he was a part of a world system that the diets were not good. And he started looking in, into this thing, into the scripture, and he got this whole thing. Well, he started, and long story short, the guy ended up turning his life around. He got his health back, uh, and then, as a result, started a ministry to help pastors and people get their health back. Amen. But the, the interesting thing about it was, he said, the, he realized, oh, he said, well, I have uh, whatever the diseases he said he had. He was diagnosed with whatever. This diabetes, that thing, uh, this problem, that problem, the other problem. And he said, oh, well, my mom and dad, or my dad had this, and my mom had that, so I have this. And he said, it must be hereditary. But then he started, when he started digging into it, he realized, wait a minute. My mom and dad ate, had the same diet and lifestyle that I have. Could the diet and lifestyle be anything to do with it? So he got a hold of that. Well, the last time I saw the guy, he was 83. I attended one of his conferences somewhere, Jacksonville, St. Augustine, little two or three hour deal. And the guy sat up there at 83. He said, I don't have one pain in my body. He said, I don't have one disease, one illness. He sat there and jumped rope for 10 minutes at 83. Now, most of us probably wouldn't want to do what he did because he drank vegetable juice and ate raw vegetables all day. God help me. Yeah, I lost all of y'all there. But he said, I got no inflammation. I got, I, the, my doctor says, I'm, I've got the body of a teenager. What did that? Well, he got out of a system. Oh, oh boy, I'm not, this is not even in my notes. But he got out of a world system of what they eat. Uh, doctor, uh, some, some doctor told me one time when they, they drew blood, they said they analyzed the blood from, I'm going to move on to my lesson in just a second. They, they analyzed the blood from someone that was a healthy, you know, eater, et cetera, and the blood looked normal, healthy. Well, they had this other guy that came in that just ate like a triple cheeseburger, fries, and a milkshake, and then they took his blood, and the blood was like, just didn't look right, right? What is that, what is that to say? That probably, the food that we eat is probably not good for us. 
right? But that's all part of the world system. Is anybody here? I'm not giving you a lesson on diet tonight. I'm giving you a lesson on the system of the world. Look at what the masses of people are doing. You look at what they're watching. You look at what they're doing. You look at their lifestyle, including diet. You look at this and that and the other. And you'll see there's going to be a general uh, wide spectrum of the results that they get. Now, I'm not saying if you eat perfect, you're going to live to be 120. But I'm saying you got to analyze these things and you got to think, what am I doing that everybody else is doing? Because here's the bottom line. If you have the results of everybody else, then it's probably safe to say that you're doing what everybody else is doing, right? Do I need to say that again? If you and I have the same results as unchurched, unwhatever people, then it's safe to say we're probably doing a lot of the same things that they're doing. It's not rocket science, right? Okay, that was my introduction. If you have your Bible, you could turn to James. I'm gonna need a towel up here because y'all already got me sweating. Stressing me out, church people, I'm telling you. Kidding, kidding. Glory to God. I wanna talk to you uh, for a few minutes tonight about how to turn from sickness to health. How to turn from sickness to health. How many of you in here want to live in health? I do. Gosh, man, I've had my share of dealing with sickness and disease, and I hate it. There's nothing good about it. It's debilitating. It's limiting. I hate it. All sickness of every kind. I hate it. Amen? So we want to turn our lives from sickness into health. Amen? James chapter 3, verse 1 says this. Dear brothers and sisters, everybody say, I'm listening. listening. Dear brothers and sisters, now this is God speaking to you. Amen? This is, I'm reading this, but this is God speaking to you right now. This ain't Darren. This is God's word speaking to you. And he says this. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Verse 2, indeed, we all make many mistakes. Can I get a witness? We all make many mistakes. For if we could control our what? If we could control our what? We could be perfect or would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Amen. Verse 3, now he gives us some illustrations. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small, keep this up there, bit in its mouth. Does anybody ever, does anybody do stuff with horses, ride horses? Anybody ever rode a horse? You're you're scared to death getting on that thing, aren't you? If you've never been on one. uh, uh, When I was in middle school, I rode this girl, a friend of mine, we were at this house and his sister, one of her friends was over and we both, all of us went out riding horses and this girl decides she's going to ride on the back of my horse. So she gets on there. And boy, that horse just took off. And she had her legs sticking out. And we went through a wooden fence, you know, gate. The fence caught the leg and she went flying off the horse. I mean, other things are powerful, aren't they? So he said, we can control a, a, a horse with a bit in its mouth. Okay, next verse. Verse four, and a small rudder. Everybody say a rudder. A rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. Keep this up there even though the winds are strong. Anybody been on a cruise ship before? Amen? How many know them things are big? And you ever see one of them things out of the water, a picture of them? In comparison to the ship, the rudder on the back is small, right? But that rudder, wherever that rudder goes is the direction the ship is going. Everybody say the rudder. Okay, then he gives uh, five in the same way, he says. It's the same thing. The tongue. Everybody say the tongue. Turn around and stick your tongue out at somebody beside you. Uh, What? What is that? That's your biggest asset and biggest liability. What is it? Your tongue. I mean, come on. He said the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. Then he gives the third example. We got a bit in a horse's mouth. We got a rudder on a ship. Now we got the third thing. 
a tiny spark. Everybody say a spark. Y'all ever see them Smokey the Bear deals out there? The commercials back in the day? Don't flick your cigarette out in the woods. You're going to burn down half of California. What is that? That's a cigarette butt that burnt down a half of a state. How did that, how did that little tiny thing light up a state? It's just a little spark that creates huge fires. So he gives us three examples, amen, the, 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 the bit, the rudder, and the spark, and he says this, the tongue is the same thing. I like the one with the spark because it's small, but it can create something massive. That's the power of that, amen. The, the, the bit, you can control something that's powerful with just a little bit, a little bit in the horse's mouth or the rudder can control. So I got this title here, How to Turn Sickness into Health, and I wanna just share a couple scriptures and thoughts tonight on how to use your tongue to turn from sickness into health. Amen. How to use your tongue to turn from sickness into health or to turn any area of your life around. Somebody said, oh, Pastor Darren, is this that word of faith teaching? Well, you can call it whatever you want to call it. I just call it the Bible, okay? Somebody said, oh, is this the name it, claim it, blab it, grab it? No, just the Bible. Amen? Just the Bible. Everybody say the Bible. Believe the Bible? Well, this is all in there. Mark eleven twenty two 22 is in there too. It says this, Jesus, after cursing the fig tree, they were on the way back 24 hours later or less. His disciples point out, look, master, the fig tree that you cursed is withered up from the roots. Can y'all picture that with me? Can you see a thriving green fig tree? You go by it, Jesus says to the tree, because was, there was no fruit on it, cursed, no one's gonna eat fruit from you ever again. Walked on down the road. Did the tree dry up then? No. They went on to the next town, walking. The next day, the Bible says. Somebody say, the next day. The next day, as they were walking back, they noticed the tree that he cursed. It wasn't green anymore. And matter of fact, not only was it not green, but the whole tree had dried up and withered up from the roots. That's a pretty instantaneous turnaround, isn't it? A green, thriving tree. Now it's dead and dried up from the roots in less than 24 hours. So then they, he, his disciples ask him about that, and then here's what Jesus said to them. Now, verse 22, he says this. Jesus replied to their questions and said this. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Anybody here? Have faith. He's about to tell them how he just cursed that tree. How the tree dried up. How did, I, how did you do that, Jesus? How did, you, how did you cause that tree to dry up from the roots in less than 24 hours? I mean, my God, nowadays they'd have, well, they probably wouldn't have the news networks out there. They'd have somebody out there, National Geographic, History Channel, somebody. What happened here? They'd be on the internet, guy speaks to tree, tree dies in less than 24 hours. They probably, nowadays, you'd think that'd be something on the National Enquirer or something, you know. No, he answered, how do you do that? Have faith in God. What do you mean, have faith? Wait, you got some kind of Jesus power going there. Did you have, you know, did you pull one out of the hat there? Did you pull out your magic wand? How did you do that? I just have faith in God. Wait a minute, you just, you just believed that God, you believed that that would happen? Yeah, then he tells him, verse 23, assuredly, I say to you, and he's saying to you and me tonight, assuredly, I say to you, whoever, who's a whoever? King James says, whosoever. Whoever or whosoever says, everybody say says. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt, everybody say doubt, doubt, doubt in his heart, but believes that those things 
that he says will be done, he'll have whatever he says. Well, that's crazy, isn't it? And all that's connected to have faith in God? So, which means to tell me I can have faith or my faith in God can actually allow me to speak to something and that something will change. Somebody pointed out and said that 20, verse 23 says, whosoever, King James, and at the end it says, whosoever shall say, the end of it says, he'll have whatsoever he says. So somebody preached it this way one time. They said, whosoever can have whatsoever by two things, speaking and believing. Now, is that in the Bible? Now, somebody said, yeah, but that's just Jesus. Well, don't, go, don't get me there tonight, okay? We done been down that road a hundred times, right? No, Jesus laid aside his deity. He's just a man, just like you and me. A human being, no God, no God power. He was God in the flesh, but he didn't exercise his God power. He laid it aside, right? He's just a man anointed by the Holy Spirit. And he said that I can have whatever I say. What is that? I don't know. There's something in that. There's something in that, amen? There's power in the tongue. There's power in the tongue. One of the things, though, Laura and I were talking today, and she said, you know, we, I've, I've been around this thing a, a number of times, uh, you know, been around some of this teaching, and I've seen people, they'll confess till their lips turn blue. But the, the, the thing is, they, they're not actually following that verse, they're thinking that when they say something, that by saying something, keep, if I keep on saying it, something's going to happen. So they're putting their faith in the words they speak. Amen? They're not putting their faith in God. They're putting their faith in hoping that the words that they speak will actually produce something. Oh, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. I confess, I confess, I confess. But Laura pointed out today, she said, no, a confession of faith is a confession of absolute conviction that this is true. And then you release that through your tongue. So a confession's not a, oh, I, I'm just going to say this 20,000 times today and I know something's got to happen. No, you've you got your faith in the wrong thing. You, you think your words, just because you're doing some formula, it's going to work. You know, and that's what we found out in the word of faith, so-called movement. A lot of these guys were going out and they were just emulating what they saw the ministers doing, but they didn't realize what I said earlier, that people like Oral Roberts, Kenneth Hagin, they actually spent years developing their relationship with God and his word. So when they actually spoke something, they had something and they didn't have, their words weren't any better than you and I's. They, their word, their faith, their words of faith were in God. Amen. They got a hold of this verse. And they actually believed God's word was true, so they began to operate in it. Did I, did I, I think I told you all the story a couple few months ago um, about uh, uh, Kenneth Hagin. He said that uh, his sister called him one time in the middle of the night. <laughs> and, he, you know, back in the day when you didn't have your cell phone by your bed or even a bit phone by your bed, he had the one phone with the long cord in the kitchen where you had to go walk to it, and it'd keep ringing and ringing and ringing, right? So he said the phone rang in the middle of the night. It kept ringing and ringing. He finally got out of bed, stubbed his toe on the, the, one of the dressers or something going there, He's grabbing that and probably not thinking good thoughts, finally gets to the phone, answers it. Well, it's somebody on there hysterical crying and, you know, couldn't understand what they were saying, where they were at, who they were, finally gets them calmed down, realizes it's his sister. And he, his sister begins to tell him in an hysterical manner uh, that Kenneth Hagin's niece had just had a baby and the baby was deformed, born deformed, and it was also had died. And, uh, or the doctor said it wasn't gonna live and maybe the baby had died, I don't remember all the details. But he's standing there on the phone. Now, he's not feeling very spiritual. He just got out of bed at whatever time in the morning, stubbed his toe on the thing, got a woman screaming at him on the phone, right? He's probably not in the spirit. But he says, apparently he had gotten a hold of something that he knew would work. And he said this, he said, I forgot what his sister's name was, but he said, tell 
so-and-so, the, 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 the mom and the husband, tell them the baby will live and not die and, it'll, and, and the baby will be normal. And she's telling him back on the phone, she said, no, you don't understand, the baby was born. He said, I said, tell them the baby will be fine and it will live and not die. Amen. Well, they got off the phone. Ten minutes later, the phone rings again. She answers the phone. I mean, he answers the phone. She's now not hysterical crying. She's hysterical crying happy tears and laughing. She said, Ken, you'll never guess what happened. She said, the doctors were holding the baby in their hands and the baby's face completely filled out and became normal. Amen. And obviously the baby lived. And when he was telling that story, the baby, the, the baby was a woman married on her own. How did he get that to work? He knew what Jesus said in cursing that fig tree and then told his disciples, whosoever will say to the mountain or to anything and not doubt in his heart, but believe that what he says will happen, that person will have what they say. But I love that he starts it in verse 22, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Who produces that stuff? Did Jesus stay there physically and dig the tree up from the roots? No, the power of God did that. Power of the Holy Spirit did it. Amen. Did you ever see in the, the book of uh, Genesis where it said God's, well, before God started speaking things into existence, it says this, the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the face of the deep. So the Holy Spirit was here in the earth. Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. And then you see where it says, God said. Well, who produced that? Must have been the only other one here. The Spirit of God. So I don't know the connection between the speaking and the acting and the doing. Who does the doing? Well, it's not you. I can tell you that much. Take yourself out of the doing part of the equation. The problem is with most of us, we think we have to do the doing. But the Lord says, no, I need you to do the believing. I'll do the doing. You do the believing and you do what I tell you to do in the process of the believing. Remember the, the Jericho deal, you know? What'd he say? You got all those walls, however many high, feet high, 40 feet high, 12 feet thick, whatever the measurements were, you know? And they're already determined 40 years in the wilderness, they're gonna do whatever the Lord says to do because they don't wanna go back there. They're the, 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 the ones that are gonna take the land that God gave them. How are you gonna take a city with 40 foot high walls and 12 foot thick walls with an army inside of it? How are you gonna do that? By faith. Faith in what? In what you can do? No, faith in what God can do. So God told them what to do. Do the whole deal. Go around one time for six days. On the seventh day, go around seven times. And when I tell you, blow the trumpets, make a shout. Well, they just believed. Oh, mama. They just believed and they stepped out with Mark eleven twenty two. have faith in God. Laura said it today on this podcast. She said, we have faith in everything but God. We have faith in the medical profession. We have faith in the financial uh, uh, arena. We have faith in, in, in uh, whatever, Oprah. We got faith in this. We got faith in everything. But not faith in, in, as a whole in God. Why is that? I already told you. It's because we're connected to the wrong system. If, if you got the same results as the rest of the world around us, you're connected to the same system they are. You got to come out of that and you got to turn your attention only if you genuinely want healing and health that God absolutely provides, you're going to have to turn completely to him. Somebody, uh, I forgot who it was, told the story about this uh, lady driving up a mountain somewhere. Anyway, she ran out of gas. Y'all heard me tell this story, some of y'all. She ran out of gas. She gets out. I don't know how she did it, what she did, but she, I don't know, she laid hands on the gas cap cover. She said, you're going to get me to where I need to go in Jesus' name. 
This car will make it to where it needs to go. Now, I know some of you people smarter than that lady would have said, oh, you should have just got gas before you left the house. Well, maybe she forgot. Well, she laid hands on the thing, said, You're, I got enough gas to get where I'm going. In Jesus' name, got back in the car, car started, and she drove however many more miles to where she is going. Amen. How'd that happen? I don't know. Who did that? I don't know who did it. And n none of us will know because you can't see into the invisible realm. I've been in services. We were at a camp decision service one year, and uh, one of the ministers there was speaking, uh, Billy Joe Watts. He comes in. He starts seeing in the spirit into this service. And he says this. He said, there's an angel at both of the door, the exit doors. Anybody remember this? Laura, you remember that? He said, he said, there's an angel standing. And then he said, I don't remember all the details, but he, something happened and there were powerful things that started happening in that service. I mean, gosh. He said, oh, they're, they're, one, one of them's blue. I thought, oh, there's blue angels. That's pretty cool. But everybody else in the room couldn't see that. It was a, a, a what is that called? A, a discerning of spirits. It's a gift of the spirit. You know that happens? You, you never read in the Bible where it said an angel appeared to Mary, an angel appeared to Joseph, an angel appeared to Zechariah, an angel appeared to this one, an angel appeared to that one, Gideon, all of them. Not all of them, but a bunch of them. I don't know how that worked. I, maybe there were some physical things, but he saw into the spiritual realm. And I've been in services. Oh, come on, all you good little Pentecostals. You know, we used to sing the song, I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Let me take it up a notch. Surely the presence, I'm just kidding. We singing about angels' wings, you know, touching us as they go by. But we don't, I wonder, do we believe that there's actually an invisible realm where last time I looked in the scripture, it said two-thirds of the angels stayed in heaven. The other third got booted with the stinko diablo. So there's two-thirds still up there with God. He's got it all anyway, right? That realm is more real than you and I looking at each other tonight. What's happening in there? I remember uh, the lady, Jeannie Wilkerson, was in a meeting one time with, uh, with, uh, at one of Brother Hagin's meetings. She said she had a spiritual vision in the middle of the meeting. She saw Jesus come in the door on a white horse. And she said he just went up and down every aisle looking at everybody. And he came up to her on the horse, looked down to her and said, she said, you know, basically something came out. Why are you here? What are you doing? He said, I'm inspecting the troops. I thought, Jesus was there? Folks. We, when we think only naturally, that's when we only get stuck thinking about what we have to do with our own ability. There is an entire spiritual realm that is there to produce the results of what you need. That, my friends, is called faith in God. Can he do it? Of course he can. The question is not can he do it. The question is can you and I believe it? Amen. Faith in God. Let's look at Romans chapter 10 quickly. Romans chapter 10. Now, I really want you to listen to this one. I just got this one and then two other quick scriptures. Romans chapter 10. It's not the words by themselves. It's the faith connected to the words. Faith in God that he said that we could actually do this. Somebody said, uh, well, I didn't say this. Nope, the scripture says it. Genesis chapter one, you should write this down. You can look it up later, wherever he says, 126, 27. I don't know if you could put that up there, or have that, Genesis 1, 26, but it's the scripture where it says, God said, let us make man in our image, right? Laura and I were talking about this. Boy, if we just get the Bible back into school, it is the eternal truth. I don't care what any of these unbelievers say God's word is truth Amen. 
Laura was saying today, I said, we're created in God's image in his likeness. Look at this. Then God said, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the uh, fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over uh, uh, all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Amen. So God created man. How did God create man? How did God create man? How is man created? Tell me. I just gave you the answer. How is man created? Who created man? How did God create man? How did he create him to be? What were they like? In his image. So then you see on through in that chapter, God, the way God created was by speaking. So if we're created in God's image, wouldn't it be safe to say that we also have that faculty in ourselves to be able to speak something, to create? This was a, one of the biggest things that God gave man in his creation. What you say goes. That's how you enforce your dominion. Ex authority is exercised by words. A king makes a decree. That's just the way that it is, folks. Amen. That's how God gave you the ability to release authority is by your words. Hello? I know, I remember Jesse Duplantis said that story. I've said it 20 times, but it's great. He said he was praying, asking the Lord about this thing. He said, I got this problem. You're not doing anything about it. And they're praying, going back and forth. And the Lord speaks to Jesse Duplantis and says, the Lord, Jesse said to him, he said, what are you gonna do about this, Lord? And the Lord spoke back to him and said, nothing. And Jesse said, come again? I'm not gonna do anything about that. And he said further, I've done all I'm gonna do about that. And then he said, the Lord spoke to Jesse Duplantis and said, I've given you the power. How? The power of life and death is in your tongue. Amen. Power of life and death is in whose tongue? God's tongue, Jesus' tongue, Holy Spirit's tongue. It's in your tongue. Yeah. Words are one of the most, now we done been down this road a hundred times. I told you about my sad country song, you know. Lord told me, don't sing that. You know, it was, he stopped loving her today. George Jones. He stopped loving her today. They placed a reef upon his door. That meant he died and he was in a casket. And the Lord said to me, I didn't realize at the time I had a soul tie to a past relationship. I didn't even realize it. And the Lord said to me, you don't want to speak that because you're actually releasing that you're never going to stop loving that person until you die. Well, I just hung that guitar up that night, didn't sing that one anymore. And guess what? Whatever that was stopped operating in my life. It wasn't what I wanted, but there was a spiritual law in motion. You know, oh, good Lord. The power of life and death is in your tongue. Amen? Romans 10, uh, quickly, verse 5. It says, now listen to this closely. For Moses, everybody say I'm listening. For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience. Look at this closely. Moses writes that the law's way, everybody say the law. What's he talking about? The, the Mosaic law, 10 commandments and all the other commandments that were made. Moses says or wrote that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands, okay? Verse six, now we have a different set of deals here. But faith's way, everybody say faith. Faith's way of getting right with God says this. Oh, get a hold of this. Don't say in your heart, who will go up to heaven and bring Christ down to the earth? 
uh, and don't say, who will go down to the place of the dead and bring Christ back to life again? Verse 8, in fact, it says, the message is very close at hand. What is that message? What, what, what is, what's close at hand? It's even on your lips and in your heart. And Paul said, that message is the very message about faith that we preach. Now, one translation says this, and this is where they got the term apparently. Paul said, this is the word of faith that we preach. That's where they got that terminology, I suppose, called the word of faith movement. It wasn't a movement as if to say it was new. It was a rediscovery of God's word in the area of the power of your words. It wasn't a new movement that came and left. People's, I've heard pastors, ministers, people say, oh, that word of faith movement's gone. Well, they must not have read Romans lately because the word of faith was here before the word of faith movement and the word of faith will be here after you and I are gone if there's people still here on the earth. Amen? So he said, this is the word of faith that we preach or the message about faith. Now, what is the message about faith? Verse nine, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll what? So this is the way. This is the scriptural way for an individual to be born again. There is no other way to be saved. Okay, this is the, come on man, you know the Romans road, right? How many good Baptists in here do we have in here? Know the Romans road. We ain't got no Baptists in here? Okay. Well, you grew up in that and you, you went out and witnessed to folks and you said you gave them the ABCs and the whole 10 steps of the Romans road. And then you get down to this one. You've got to confess with your mouth. Is that only for salvation? No. That's how you appropriate all of God's blessings. That's how you enforce your authority in the earth. How? By this same mechanism. What? You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Now, verse 10 summarizes it. He said this, for if by, it, is by, it is by believing. Everybody say believing. It is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. And it's by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. Now, I do not have the full revelation of this verse. I should, but I don't right at this moment. But we can see here, it's by believing in your heart and speaking with your mouth that change happens. Now, I started out saying that how to, the title was How to Turn. Everybody say turn. How to turn from sickness to health. How to turn. How do you turn from sickness and get into health and healing? Well, one of the Bible, one of the, these principles, and this is just one of several healing lessons that we've been giving, but I believe it's an important one, is through the proper use of words. Everybody say words. Now, it's, you got to get the two, connect, Mark Hankins said this, you got to get your believer, your believer connected to your speaker. You ever try to play music and you realize your speaker is not connected? You got to go back there and pull, find the wire, plug it back in. Well, you're playing something, but it's not coming out, which means you can't hear it. There's no sound. So you, Lars said it today, you can have something in your heart, but the power is released when you speak it. So you've got to have an established conviction of faith in God's word, and then you declare what God's word says. Uh, uh, Mark Hankins said it this way, God's word in your mouth is just as powerful as God's word in his mouth. Amen. Anybody here? You're going, you're going home. Okay. Last quick two verses, and I'm going to just, we'll do some confessions and be done. Uh, Proverbs 18, 12, I love this verse. It says this, before destruction, uh, nope, nope, that ain't it. Did I give you the wrong verse? Proverbs 18, 12? No, it should be 18, 12. 
said the tongue of the wise. Maybe I got the wrong verse there. I apologize. Did I do it backwards? Well, I really missed that one by a mile. 15-2, she said. Okay. So it says this, the tongue of the... No, that's not it either. It says uh, the, the piercings of a sword and then something, the tongue of the wise brings healing. Uh, anyway. Well, at least we'll get the reference so you can mark. I had it backwards. I had a moment of dyslexia. I apologize. Got the numbers backwards. Okay. Somebody said, Pastor Darren, you shouldn't say that. Oh, don't be the confession police, okay? I was just kidding. <laughs> That's, oh boy, you ever had the confession police come after you? Oh, don't say that. You know, I'm kidding. It's not, I'm not saying it as I, I want this to happen. It's a joke. Okay, that's a whole nother sermon. Okay, Proverbs 12, 18. There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword. But, I love this, the tongue of the what? The tongue of the wise promotes health. What's the other translations I gave you? Oh, you probably don't have the, oh. Rash language cuts and maims, but there is healing in the words of the wise. I think you could say this about wisdom and scriptural wisdom. A wise person knows how to use their tongue. They know when to speak, they know when not to speak. They know what to say at the right time to say, say to say it at the right time, you know what I mean? Wisdom, wisdom will teach us how to use our words more accurately. And wise words bring healing, everybody say healing. Last verse, Joel 3.10, says uh, this, Beecher, don't know what that means, okay, but I know what the last part says. Let the weak, what? Say. Let the weak say. They were, they were having to go fight against somebody. So they, they said, Get, turn your farming tools into weapons. You're getting ready to go out there and kick some butt. And you may not think you're strong enough to do this, but the Lord said through the prophet, let the weak ones among you say, I am strong. Yeah, but I'm not strong. Yeah, but the Lord said, I'm behind you, so you need to say, I am strong. Amen? I am strong. Somebody say, I am strong. Okay, I want to end with this. I brought some of these. I don't know if you guys have them back there, uh, but I got these uh, confessions that I say on a regular basis. Anytime, most times that I have some kind of a, a symptom or a sickness that tries to attach itself to my body, I, this is one of the first places I go, and I begin speaking these scriptures. It's from Charles Capp's book, uh, The Tongue, A Creative Force. Uh, I can't say that I've ever read and finished that book, but I have read the confessions in the back at least a thousand times. They're powerful. Your words affect your direction. And whether you and I realize it or not, sickness is oftentimes a result of poorly spoken words in the past. Somebody said it this way, yesterday's confessions are today's realities. Now, you may say, oh, Pastor Aaron, I'm like you. I just say stuff as a joke. Yeah, but you got to you gotta be honest about yourself. You read something on WebMD, you're like, oh, man, my side really hurts. Man, I, oh, I think I got the flu. Man, I feel all them symptoms coming on. Now, when you say that, that's not a joke. You actually believe that. Is anybody here? See, that, that thing, see, I, I'm, I lose some of you on that because you, you, we, we've gotten dull of hearing on this. You've got to look at it just the way the scripture says it. If you believe with your heart and speak with your mouth, that stuff is working for you, good or bad. How many of us have said in our lifetime, I can't afford that. I can't afford that. I can't buy that. Right? I can't afford that. I can't. I can't get out of this hole. I can't accomplish that. I can't do this. 
oh, my, my, the so-and-so is telling me, I, 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 my boss saying, I got to do this. I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. We believe and we speak. And then what happens? Our words literally box us in. Our words create the boundaries around our lives. Folks, I can't make this any more plain than, than the scripture says, but here's some confessions that I do. I don't know if you have those back there. Oh, oh, good, look. I'm gonna read these. You can read them uh, and listen. He says, I am the body of Christ. When Darren Baldwin has any kind of a symptom, sign of sickness, this is one of my number one go-tos. Why do I do this? Because I believe that my words have power. Because Kenneth Hagin said, no, because the Bible says. Because Or Robert said, no, because the Bible says. Said my tongue is the directing force of my life. My tongue produces life and death. My tongue can promote healing. I can have what I say. Why do I say these things? I am the body of Christ. What does that mean? I mean Christ. And look at this, Satan has no power over me. I, I overcome evil with good. I am the body of Christ. I'll sit on this one for 20 minutes sometimes. And by the end of it, I got it. I'm, I, I'm in Christ. Which says this, I'm dead to sickness. See what I'm saying? So now I'm not only building my faith, but I'm also releasing my faith. I am of God, the second one. And I have overcome Satan. I am of God. I, I'm born of God. I'm a new creation. I'm born of God. I, I have overcome Satan. Or I can say I've overcome sickness. Why? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. The greater one's in me. The sickness is not greater than the greater one in me. So what am I doing? I'm releasing God's word. What does God's word do? When you release it in faith, the heavenly powers or forces begin to go to work to produce that. That's how this thing works. You don't do, you believe and speak. I am of God and I've overcome Satan for greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Verse uh, the next one, I, am, I will fear no evil. Boy, this one's been getting on me good this last couple of years. I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me, Lord. What do I have to be afraid of if God's with me and for me and in me? What do I have to be afraid of? I fear no evil because you're with me, Lord. Your word and your spirit, they bring comfort to me. Glory to God. I fear no evil because you're with me, Lord. Listen to this next one. I am far from oppression. I'm far from oppression. You know how many times I've said over the years, I'm depressed. I'm in depression. Well, I was saying, I was saying something contrary to God's word, but I believed it and I stayed in depression. The Lord spoke to me one time when I was running on the treadmill, when I was depressed. And he said, you know what your problem is? I said, what? He said, you're not walking by faith. I said, excuse me? Yeah, you're preaching faith, but you're not walking by faith. You're believing that you're depressed and you're telling everybody you're depressed. Instead, God's word says, I'm far from oppression. I could say I'm far from depression. Fear does not come near me. Everybody knows this next one, most people. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Well, wait, the sickness, you know what the devil's been telling me this last several months? The same thing he's been telling me for the last 20 plus years, but he's been telling me in a more intensified manner. He said, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna, now he doesn't just tell me outright, he, he'll put a symptom on you and then tell you, you're gonna have this disease and you're gonna die in months. And you know, if you're not careful, fear comes in. I'm human just like everybody else. Fear comes in. And then you start meditating on that. Yeah, then you get on WebMD and you start confirming all your fears that that's what you have and you know, you better start writing your goodbye letters and all that. No, you think I'm being funny. That's the truth. This is the spirit, this is the spirit, what people call spiritual warfare. But I've been telling the devil, 
Because he said, I'm going to drag you down to the end. Even if you get healed, I'm going to drag you down to the end. You're going to be wasted away. And people are going to think you're going to die anyway. And you know what I stood up? I said, I said, no, you're not. I will not allow you to ravish my body and put my body into an emaciated state. You have no authority to do that. What am I doing? I'm doing what Jesus did, speaking the word of God at, as a sword against the lies of the enemy. Your mind will become the devil's playground unless you learn how to take captive your thoughts. Amen. And if you don't take captive your thoughts that are from the devil, the devil's thoughts, he'll start stacking them up and then all of a sudden they'll get walled up and they become what the scripture calls a stronghold. Now a stronghold is you are convinced that you have this, that, or the other, or you're stuck in this predicament. That is a stronghold, my friend. I'm stuck in this addiction and can't get out. But God's word says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. No weapon. No weapon formed against me will prosper. No weapon. One guy sang it and said, not one, two, three, no weapon. You can't put the flu on me. That weapon will not prosper. You can't put cancer and diabetes on me. That weapon will not prosper. You cannot have your way with my physical body, devil. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. What do you do? Kenneth Hagin says this. Most Christians are sincere, though sincerely weak. And he said the reason they are weak is because of one thing. They have not boldly declared what God's word says about them. Weakness is allowed to continue on in our lives because we as believers do not take our sword and play offense. No, I'm not staying poor, devil. Poverty is a, a something in the fallen world. It's a curse. So what do I declare? The hundreds of scriptures about prosperity and blessing and people say people outside of these walls maybe some of us have said it oh melody they believe in the prosperity gospel no i believe in the bible yeah. and scripture says he was made poor so that i through his poverty might be made rich it said all grace can abound towards me that i always having all sufficiency in all things abound unto every good work that means i'm so prosperous i can give into every single project that comes along that has to do with the gospel what is that bible that's that some of that denominational religious thinking that says oh that's a prosperity gospel no there's only one gospel and it includes blessing healing protection peace and all of it so what do I do? I've got to get that stuff into my heart and I've got to begin to speak it. No evil, I skipped one, no evil will befall me, nor any plague come near my dwelling. No evil will befall me, nor any plague. Somebody said the other day, pestilences, the word pestilence is in the Bible. It means uh, what's the word we just, pandemic. It means pandemic. Did we not just go through that? Guess what? The Bible has pestilences as plural. There's gonna be more. How will you walk through the next one? How are you gonna make it through? You gonna shut yourself away and never come out and not come to church and all that stuff? That's what the world does. Now you need to pray and be led by the Holy Ghost. But you got to have your faith strong. And you need to begin to speak. Somebody, I had never even heard of monkey pox. I never even heard the term, not one time in the last several months. Craig Hagen down in St. Thomas this past week said, I'm already declaring 
that monkey pox will never come near my body. Now, you can say it until your lips turn blue. If you don't believe it, you might have a chance of whatever that is coming upon your body. So how do you get the conviction? You turn your attention to, away from the world system, to God's word, to the things of the spirit, and you begin to declare what God says boldly. Is anybody here? If, if I had time, maybe we'll pick this up next week and talk about the, how, how this works in the, the authority of the believer. Amen. Amen. Because the authority says, when the devil comes against you like a roaring lion, you resist him. Steadfast in the faith. And then he flees from you. You, most Christians, like one guy said in testifying, he said, uh, um, I got the devil on the run. And oh, everybody said, oh, praise God. Yo, no, no, that's not what I meant. He's running and he's chasing me. I'm running away from him. I got the devil on the run. You get it? No, you need to get him on the run. How do you do that? Stand up, hold your authority up. You say, not another inch further. Yeah, but these symptoms are getting worse in my body. You stand on the word, those symptoms have to leave. Yeah. Or else God is a liar. Yeah. Or else God is a liar. Because God said, if I stand my ground, the devil will flee from me. Yeah. Folks, I'm, I'm, just, I'm going to end. You, you, please. Please. You, if you want to walk in health and healing, and I'm preaching to myself right now, you have got to settle once and for all that healing is God's plan. You've got to settle it. You can't you, you do whatever you got to do. You, you, you got to settle it. You can't keep saying, oh, I'm going to lean in the medical world, and then I'm going to come over here to faith world, and then I'm going to go to the medical. You know, that may be where you are now, but don't stay there. Get in on God's healing plan. Yes. It's a lot cheaper. Yeah. Those insurance costs just go up and up and up. But God's price is the same. It's free. Yeah. It's the best health care plan that's ever been. And I'm feeling some of your struggle right now. One or two in here. You want this so bad. But you just got to put yourself in this word. Get around anything that's healing. Turn aside from the, 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 the system of sickness and disease. Yeah. You got to realize that stronghold, you're, the most people, are, they're, they're so far surrounded with the thinking and believing of sickness and disease, it's almost impossible to get out of it. You, you got you to, gotta, what's that word where they, they, they do an Intervention. You guys do that with the addicts. You do an intervention. You got to go in there. You got to save them from themselves. And I'm trying to give you a little bit of a beginning of an intervention here. You got to get out of that system. Yeah, but what do I do? What happens if I get, what, what, but, but it's all doubt. And that's okay if you're there. But a firm persuasion of God's word in the area of healing, that's the only way that you can speak. If you don't have the faith, the words will be meaningless. Where does faith come? Comes from God's word. Amen. Do you receive that tonight? I'm giving you everything I can. This ain't Sunday morning service. This is school. Amen. Come on. Glory to God. Put that up there. As you why don't you stand up? Put that uh, first one or two up there. Amen. I am the body. You say that out loud. You say that. You, I want to hear you say it. You're really terrible at this. Just say it on your own. Say it on your own. Too fast. We're slow readers. Go back. I, I am the, I don't want to lead. Just say it out loud to your, there we go.
Glory to God. Now, Charles Capp says in that book, Tongue of Creative Force, he said, you take those scriptures, you say them three times a day over yourself in faith. And he said, watch that situation turn around. Physically, financially, in any area, you can apply this. Faith works the same in every area. You be diligent, get that stuff in your heart and then release it several times throughout the day. And then he says, once you get whatever it is you need, he said, just do maintenance, regular maintenance. Do it once a week, a few times a, a day, well, you know, whatever. You gotta keep those words speaking. It's your force field. Folks, please don't leave here thinking that let the devil talk you out of this. This is one of the most powerful ways that God can turn your life a, around from sickness to disease, from poverty to, to abundance. It works and it works every time because God's word is true, amen? Somebody say amen. amen. I don't know if we have those, if you want, we'll figure out a way. If, if, if Rachel can email them out to you or you can go on uh, and spend the 99 cents on Kindle to get the Charles Capps book. It's got the confession. Just Google Charles Capps healing confessions. They'll come up for free, how about that? But speak them. Begin to discipline yourself to speak God's word. Don't say what you say. Brother Hagin said, the Lord said to him, my people are, they're, 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 instead of saying what they have, they're having what they say. Uh, or did I say that backwards? Oh, no, no. You, instead of having what they say, they're saying what they have. So I'm sick. I could say I'm sick. Well, I have that. No, I don't need to say that. I need to say what God's word says. By his stripes, I'm healed. This sickness will not prosper in my body. Oh, you know, and then you get all the worldly stuff coming out. No, 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 you gotta speak God's word. I promise it works every time or else the Bible's a lie and none of it's true. So we know that's not true, amen. God's true, amen. How many love the Lord? Amen, his word is the most powerful. Can I say this before you go? Lauren and I have been talking the last several weeks. We are convinced we have got to teach the word because I'm looking across. I know there's people teaching it, but I don't see it in the mainstream. I see a lot of Christians that are getting good messages, good help messages that help their life, maybe even good Bible sermons. But we have got to get a hold of these truths. This is God's plan for the body of Christ that we believe, we walk by faith, we speak, we walk in health, we walk in abundance, we walk in our authority, we walk in who we are in Christ. We've got to teach these things and you and I have got to walk in them which means we've got to dedicate our lives to the pursuit of these truths. Amen? We're going to be in eternity forever. You only got a few years on the, here on the earth to do what God's called you to do. Make that time count and do it God's way. Don't do it the world's way. Amen? I love you.